Good morning and welcome to yet another session of the course The History of English Language and Literature. With this lecture we come to the last leg of our discussion on the Augustan age and the age of Pope. At the outset itself let me also uh, recall your attention to the political background in England at that point of time. The uh, ruling monarchs were mainly from the house of uh, Stuart and from the house of Hanover. Uh, there was also this act of union at the beginning of the 18th century which ensured that Scotland united with England and Wales also uh, leading to the emergence of the Great Britain. There was also this war of Spanish succession which happened in 1711 which prevented the union of uh, the French and uh, Spanish monarchies and also preserved the smaller states of Holland. So this was the political background in which most of this uh, art literature and other social sort of institutions were emerging in uh, Augustan England. So taking a look at the monarchs who were ruling uh, during this time, after Queen Anne it was King George the first who ascended the throne of uh, uh, England. He was the first monarch of the house of Hanover and if we remember Queen Anne belonged to the house of Stuarts. Queen Anne also was incidentally King George the first second cousin. Uh, George was born in Hanover in Germany and he was the closest living Protestant royal relative of uh, Anne and it was uh, because his mother uh, Sophia of Hanover was a granddaughter of James I who ruled over England in the beginning of the 17th century. It's also said that there were about 50 Catholics during that time with close blood relationships to Anne but however uh, the act of settlement of 1701 had prevented the uh, ascension of any Catholic uh, as, a, as a British uh, monarch. So this had led to the uh, line of lineage to be traced uh, until uh, uh, George I who was born and brought up in Hanover in Germany. George I was highly unpopular with the British public and with the British parliament. Uh, it was mainly due to his supposed inability to speak English but however later historians do show evidence of his, uh, uh, his knowledge of the language but however uh, he did not go down very well with the uh, English public and he was also much ridiculed by his contemporaries. It was during the reign of George I that the powers of uh, the monarch diminished considerably in England. And we also find Britain uh, transitioning to a cabinet system of government primarily led by a prime minister. And this is also the time which uh, saw the emergence of Sir Robert Walpole to power. He is also considered by later historians as Britain's first de facto prime minister. George II succeeded George I and he was the last British monarch to be born outside Great Britain. He was also like his predecessor born and brought up in the northern Germany. He also had very little control over the British domestic policy and we also find that he and his uh, uh, government the, the actions were largely controlled by the parliament and we also see the growing power of Sir Robert uh, Walpole even during his reign. Uh, there was a general assumption that with the ascension of uh, George II there was a possibility that uh, Sir Robert uh, Walpole could be thrown out of power but we do find him coming back with uh, uh, greater powers and greater authority and we also find the powers of the monarch diminishing considerably uh, continuing to diminish considerably. And uh, King George II had many challenges to face apart from the popular opposition. Uh, his own son Frederick Prince of Wales also was a figurehead of a political opposition uh, during his uh, reign and uh, his son Frederick in fact uh, they did not have a good relationship with each other. The uh, prince was also left behind in Germany for about 14 years when the father and son uh, did not even see each other. So this strained relationship with the opposing kind of ideologies in terms of their ideas of power absolute monarchy uh, we do find them getting into a lot of trouble with each other but however Prince uh, Frederick he also died uh, nine years earlier than uh, the father so this had in a certain way prevented some other challenges that uh, King George II would have otherwise uh, faced. Overall George II is remembered only with much disdain by his contemporaries and also by the posterity. He had a lot of mistresses which was not very agreeable to the English public. He also was very short tempered and he displayed extreme boorishness of character. So this was the kind of monarchs who succeeded uh, after Queen Anne and we, don't, we do not find him making a significant or a considerable contribution towards the development of art, uh, literature and culture but nevertheless we do not find them interfering much in the affairs of the uh, state or the affairs of culture or society either. So we also find them quite alienated and quite removed from the reality of the nation during those times. Uh, it's also uh, useful to take a look at who Sir Ra Robert Walpole was. This particular quote by a later historian sums up his role and his character. Walpole was one of the greatest politicians in British history. He played a significant role in sustaining the Whig party safeguarding the Hanoverian succession and defending the principles of the glorious revolution. 
He established stable political supremacy for the Whig party and taught succeeding ministers how to establish an effective working relationship between crown and parliament. So this was the beginning of a sustainable and a more peaceful kind of relationship between the crown and the parliament which also led to a lot of stability and a lot of positivity within the nation. Nevertheless Walpole was severely criticized by many of his contemporary not just politicians but also uh, other writers and uh, thinkers of those times. He was criticized by uh, for instance by Gay, Swift, Pope, Fielding and Johnson at a later point. Uh, but however, Walpole enjoyed much popular support, uh, primarily due to his policy of avoiding war, which also had brought down the taxation significantly in England. If we remember, right from the medieval ages, one of the major contestations of the commoners with the, uh, with the court and with the parliament was this uh, continuing increase of uh, taxes in order to uh, fund the major uh, wars and other kinds of voyages that the monarch was undertaking in order to expand uh, his or her empire. So, we find all of that considerably uh, declining during this time and also uh, we find the British public engaging more in other sort of uh, more fruitful kind of activities and uh, more intellectual debates which uh, were to uh, take the nation to a greater heights and greater glory in the coming centuries. Coming back to a discussion of the socio-cultural and literary uh, life of uh, uh, the age of Pope, it is very important to uh, take a look at uh, the existence of a particular club known as Scribblerus Club. This was an informal association of authors based in London. This was in that sense a literary club which was founded in 1713-14. The nucleus of this uh, club included writers such as Jonathan Swift and Alexander Pope. The other major members were John Gay, John Arbuthnot and Thomas Parnell. Five of them they continued to influence and define and uh, redefine the cultural life and literary life of London in multiple ways. One of their significant contribution to the uh, literary life of uh, London which also led to much amusement and uh, much entertainment in uh, contemporary London was their creation of this character Martinus Scribblerus. He was a prototype who was the target of all kinds of attack on uh, the uh, abuses of uh, learning. So, much of this attire was also centered on this fictional character Martinus Scribblerus. Uh, there is an assumption that uh, perhaps Pope was the one who created this uh, character, but however all of them contributed in multiple ways to the uh, formation and uh, uh, the popularization of this uh, character. This term was uh, taken from two different sources. Firstly, it was uh, uh, based on Dryden's uh, comic character Sir uh, Martin Morrall, who was uh, synonymous with absurd error. Scribblerus was an extension of the word uh, scribbler, which was a contemporary term of contempt for a talentless writer. And we find them together, five of them together together uh, producing this uh, collaborative work, Memoirs of Martinus Scribblerus. It was published only much later in 1741. Uh, only Pope and Swift in fact lived to see uh, it published and the group also, uh, uh, the, uh, the Scribblerus club also gets dissolved after the death of all the five members. It said that in this collaborative work most of the ideas were Arbuthnot. He was considered as the uh, wittiest and the most industrious of all the five. The character uh, Martinus Scribblerus also uh, is the central uh, hero of Pope's uh, Dunciad. So this was a very significant uh, contribution to Pope's work and also a significant way in which all uh, kinds of absurd learning was uh, satirized in uh, uh, during the age of Pope. Uh, there is also this assumption that uh, Gay's Beggar's opera grew out of a suggestion from Swift. In th these ways they continue to inform each other's work and also influence each other's production in uh, varied ways. So the other popular references to Martinus Scribbler are also quite significant. Uh, Richard Owen Cambridge, one of the other important writers of the period, uh, he had produced a mock epic poem titled Scribbleriat and in this also the hero is uh, incidentally Martinus Scribbleris. Uh, Fielding later staged a particular play Welsh opera. This was also a tribute to the Scriblerians. Interestingly, Fielding's uh, pen name was Scriblerus Secondus, again a tribute to the uh, original Martinus Scriblerus. There were also two more members to this uh, literary club, Robert Harley uh, and uh, Henry St. John. Both of them, uh, just like uh, the uh, other major five uh, important figures, they were also Tories. Uh, but uh, however, we do not find them making a significant literary contribution, but there is enough evidence to show that they were also part of the club in significant ways. So these are the two uh, major works which uh, refer to uh, this fictional character Martinus uh, Scribblerus in 18th century. The other important literary events of the period include the publication and the popularization of various uh, periodicals. And we also noted in the previous session that the periodical essay was a 
new contribution of the 18th century which also led to the uh, emergence of a proper kind of journalism in uh, England uh, in the later decades. Gentleman's Journal ran from 1692 to 1694. It popularized middle-brow ideas on society, culture, manners and morals and literature and life. So, in that sense, it was uh, uh, mostly uh, targeted at a middle class audience who was also uh, becoming quite uh, significant in the uh, development of the nation. Instantly, uh, uh, another magazine with a similar title, Gentleman's uh, Magazine, it ran from 1731 till 1914 and continue, uh, enjoyed a, a greater popularity and a greater run than the original one. The Grub Street Journal, which ran from 1730 till 1777, uh, uh, was a satirical literary magazine of those times. It continued to inform the ways in which literary satires were uh, received and popularized even in the later decades. The monthly review was uh, yet another significant uh, periodical of those times. The Makata was a trade journal published by Daniel Defoe. Uh, we recalled even in the earlier session that there was uh, even another one, uh, the review published by Defoe, which was uh, majorly eclipsed by the success of uh, Tatler and Spectator. The significance of coffee houses defined the ways in which socio-cultural life was uh, framed in uh, London. And uh, this was one of the most important coffee houses of those times, the Bedford Coffee House. Uh, located in Covent Garden. It was the centre of all kinds of activity in London in the 1730s. That was the Bedford Coffee House was considered as the emporium of wit, the seat of criticism and the standard of uh, taste. We also find that journalism during this time, it becomes an integral part of the literary careers of all uh, the major writers. We also noted how most of them, regardless of whether they were primarily poets or dramatists or uh, uh, novelists, they also uh, had tried their hand at this uh, act of journalism in one form or the other. Even in the age of Pope, even in the 18th century, we find that London continues to be the uh, center of all kinds of activities. It also emerges to the stature of uh, being the cultural capital of Britain. It also dominates and influences the taste of the nation. Right from a discussion uh, London from the uh, pre-medieval times until the 18th century, we know that the stature of London continues undiminished irrespective of the political changes, the uh, religious uh, changes that come in and also all kinds of socio-cultural uh, changes that were built in. London continues to receive all these changes and transform it transform itself into uh, uh, an ever-growing and, an, uh, and a multicultural and also a cosmopolitan kind of city, continuing to be at the hem of all kinds of affairs in uh, England. The other major prose writers of this 18th century include John Arbuthnot. Uh, he was the author of the history of John Bull. He was also one of the significant members of the uh, literary club Scribblerist Club. And uh, Swift had a lot of nice things to say about Arbuthnot, which also contributed to uh, much of his uh, fame. Uh, during his contemporary period and also in the later period. Swift once uh, wrote to a friend, if the world possessed but a dozen Arbuthnots, I would burn my Gulliver's travels. This was the kind of uh, uh, affection that they all had for each other. And uh, John Arbuthnot significantly was also the physician of Queen Anne who was incidentally present even a few days before her death. Henry St. John, again another significant member of the club who uh, did not make much of literary contribution, is also said to have written pamphlets and uh, some stray productions on politics and philosophy, which uh, um, sadly has not survived into the posterity. Uh, Francis Atterbury's writings have also been forgotten, uh, but he was also mostly remembered because of the good relationships that he maintained with the contemporary uh, writers and the contemporary leaders of those times. Colley Sibber is another writer that we shall come back to shortly. He is mostly remembered for his uh, biography uh, titled The Apology. Right from the uh, post-restoration period, we noted that drama was steadily declining. But nevertheless, it was uh, it would not be fair to say that there was there were no dramatic productions at all uh, during the age of Pope. There was certainly a certain kind of drama which continued to exist, though it was uh, steadily declining. Drama was of uh, very slight importance in the age of Pope, and especially uh, after the Licensing Act, the playwrights were more cautious in their choice of topics. This also had led to a severe restriction uh, which had been imposed on the kind of uh, uh, treatment, the kind of uh, uh, topics which they could talk about and also the general uh, creativity and spontaneity associated with drama. Addison's Cato is perhaps the uh, most significant work, uh, dramatic work of those times. It was a tragedy. Though it was uh, criticized for uh, being uh, not so popular and not so adhering to the taste of the public, it's important to note that George Washington was deeply influenced by this uh, um, tragic drama and it was a popular play in the United States at a later point for a while. Most of the dramatists of this time 
time owing to the post restoration influence they all uh, displayed a marked determination to purify the english stage from the licentiousness of the restoration drama and we also find that uh, history uh, teaches us how reactions uh, to a particular sort of literary taste could uh, even um, go to the extreme levels this was such a case and we uh, note that political satires and wit uh, continue to be common so just like uh, in prose they continue to dominate even in the uh, stage and there was also more emphasis on the plot this type of drama was mostly classified under sentimental comedy the major theatres of this time included Drury Lane and Little Theatre we do not find them flourishing in the same way that uh, they did during the Elizabethan times coming back to this important figure Colley Sibba who was also a prose writer we note that he, in terms of uh, drama he was an actor manager and a playwright his uh, contribution to drama was quite prolific in the sense that he is said to have produced about 25 plays in his own company at uh, Drury Lane uh, he was an untiring supporter of the wig it's also said to have uh, earned him the position of the uh, poet laureate of England and many feel that this was only a political honor and not an artistic honor given the uh, limited intellectual uh, capacities that Kali Sibha had and uh, mm, Swift, uh, Pope and Fielding who were certainly more competent, who were certainly considered to be more competent than Sibha were also excluded from being considered as a poet laureates because they were mostly uh, Tory supporters. So, he is uh, uh, one of the writers who uh, gained a lot of mileage through his political affiliations. His play Love's Last Shift is now more like a forgotten curiosity. Richard III was an adaptation of Shakespeare's play with the same title and the non-juror was an adaptation from Molière's uh, very famous play uh, Tartuffe. And this also included a lot of references against the Roman Catholics. So, he was uh, exactly the kind of uh, a writer who knew how to play to the sentiments and how to play to the uh, affiliations of the political and religious uh, themes of those times. His personality was quite brash and extroverted, so he was not a favorite of his co uh, contemporaries. We find it getting uh, reflected in many of the writings of those times. Pope incidentally had criticized Sibber's miserable mutilation of crucified Molière and hapless Shakespeare, referring to the adaptations that he performed earlier, Richard III and the non-juror. Sibber incidentally is also the hero of the second version of Pope's uh, Danciad. Pope makes Sibber the king of dances in his second version of uh, Danciad. Fielding also had a satire at Sibber uh, quite a lot. He in fact uh, tries Sibber for the murder of English language. We do find that these writers quite successfully managed to tarnish the literary reputation of Kali Sibber perhaps forever. Sibber's plays however they were coarse but uh, they were also rooted in uh, moral intentions. He popularized this image of the fop or the dandy and he often played this a part himself. Uh, people often ridiculed him for that. However, in most of his plays, one of his favorite characters uh, was this unfaithful and slightly dull husband, which also was the cause of much amusement during the age of Pope. He is perhaps best known for his autobiography published in 1740 titled An Apology for the Life of uh, Colley Sibber Comedian. Generally, it is considered that his best play was the one that uh, was staged uh, in 1704 named The Careless Husband. This play was a huge success and this was really a big deal given that drama was not one of the popular genres of those times. It was also a repertory play which uh, continued to be played uh, throughout the 18th century. Uh, many critics have considered this as mature, plausible, subtle, natural and affecting, especially Bates and had a lot of nice things to say about uh, uh, the play in the posterity. Uh, there is this uh, very popular and famous scene which uh, was much applauded then and also uh, appreciated at later points of time for the kind of uh, compactness and the kind of uh, wit that it had. It's known as a Steenkirk instantly is a neck scarf and uh, in this particular scene there is this protagonist the husband who is caught in an act of adultery by the wife. The uh, husband was cheating uh, with, the, uh, with the maid of the house and we uh, find that this wife uh, expresses what was then uh, much praised as a, a wifely tact and she uh, does not create a scene over there but instead out of concern for husband she covers uh, the neck of the husband with a scarf with a steen kirk and so that he does not uh, catch cold and also leaves behind the scarf so that the husband later comes to know that the wife did catch him in the act of adultery but chose not to create a ruckus over there. This wifely tact uh, as uh, the uh, popular critics then called it was much appreciated and this scene was considered very popular uh, during those times. 
Uh, but however, uh, there were also a few uh, critiques about this to which uh, he responds at a later point of time in 1707 through his play The Lady's Last Stick. And this was a very bad tempered reply to the critics of uh, wifely patience. But however, the popular support was mostly for the uh, Steenkirk scene which appreciated the uh, patience that the wife uh, displayed even when uh, encountered with an act of adultery. So, we do find that the ladies last sick what was not a huge success, it was uh, quite coldly received by the uh, public. It also tells us about the moral tendencies of those times and also about the ways in which uh, the, uh, the morality was operating in terms of uh, gender as well. In an age when women did not have much of a literary and cultural presence, we find the emergence of this particular uh, dramatist Susanna St. Livre who lived from 1680 till 1722. Her uh, career was quite illustrious. We find her producing 14 comedies, 2 tragedies and 3 farces that too at an age when drama was not a popular genre. She is considered as uh, the second woman at the English stage after Afra Ben and her plays instantly were only uh, staged mostly after her death. During her own life career, we do not find her enjoying uh, much popular support. Uh, this is an extract from one of her writings. And why this wrath against the women's work? Perhaps you'll answer, because they meddle with things out of their sphere. But I say no, for since the poet is born, why not a woman as well as a man? So she was also, just as her writing points out, critiqued much for uh, doing things out of her sphere. And some of her popular works include The Gamester, The Wonder a Woman Keeps Secret and bold stroke for a wife. All of them incidentally, they showcased very confident and self-possessed heroines and uh, these heroines incidentally, they had one trait in common. They fought hard to keep uh, both love and property. Unlike the popular image of the uh, woman who was willing to give away property but only uh, fight for love. Susanna St. Livre incidentally, uh, she herself personally believed in uh, women's right to property which was a very rare thing then and also she argued for economic uh, independence of women and also for equal social status along with men and she also argued for the uh, revisioning of the marriage laws of those times which was uh, uh, quite unfavorable to the women. Bridget Steele apart from the illustrious career that uh, he enjoyed as a writer of uh, periodical essay, he was also a playwright of uh, notable reputation. In his works we find him uh, stressing filial duty, marital fidelity and love again as a response to the uh, licentious of the restoration drama which had dominated the English uh, stage for quite a while. Uh, some of his important works include The Constant Lovers, The Funeral, the lying lover and the tender husband. We find a lot of moralizing in his place. He uh, celebrated the moral values in terms of virtue and also in terms of behavior. And he, in his own words, uh, his aim was to ensure that there was no improper entertainment in a Christian commonwealth. Uh, but at the same time, he forgot to uh, include the dramatic elements and dramatic aspects in his works. This led to a major criticism of his works uh, during the contemporary and as well as uh, uh, from the later historians and critics that he had forgotten that the first business of comedy is to amuse and not to preach. Steele turned his stage into a sort of lay pulpit and became the founder of sentimental comedy. So, sentimental comedy is uh, much credited to him. This was a very highly uh, genteel kind of uh, comedy which uh, included uh, a lot of didactism. It was also considered as a vapid kind of play. So, what exactly was sentimental comedy? Uh, uh, one of the most uh, important practitioners of this uh, kind of uh, comedy was George Lillo who was a tradesman and non-conformist. His Puritan influence perhaps also led to uh, him in a lot of didactic elements into his plays. Uh, his important works include uh, London Merchant or History of George Barnwell and uh, Fatal Curiosity. Uh, his work, uh, his drama was mostly a domestic uh, drama in which he took characters and uh, incidents from common life and not uh, notably from history or from romance. In that sense, it was closer to the real life than many of the other plays. And he also was uh, the kind of person who celebrated through his work the power of the middle class moral spirit which was steadily on the rise uh, from the 18th century onwards. So, if we try to sum up the uh, age of Pope or the Augustan age of English uh, literature, uh, it's important to note that politically it led to the establishment of uh, Protestant monarchy. Uh, the ability to politically saw the establishment of the Protestant monarchy in which uh, the uh, rulers began to display how it was to rule along with an effective parliament rule. We also see England moving towards uh, a certain democratic spirit though, uh, though it had not yet fully emerged. We also find the predominance of rational thought in almost everything in science, religion, 
uh, literature and even in human relationships. And this also find its reflection in the writings of those times which was more intellectual and more uh, rational than uh, emotional. We also find that uh, not just literature but art, culture, religion, everything is more town centric. There is a prolific increase in coffee houses and uh, them emerging as centers of activity and there are also a lot of literary clubs and similar sort of uh, groups which are on the rise. We also find the rise of the middle class values which also directly lead to the emergence of uh, newer kinds of uh, writing and newer kinds of genres. With this we come to the end of a discussion on the age of Pope or the Augustan age of uh, English literature which certainly laid the foundations of the rise of the novel which is uh, what we will take a look at in the forthcoming sessions. Thank you for listening and we look forward to seeing you in the next session.